But right now, we've got the man, the myth, one of the coolest casts that I know, Mr. Jeffrey Vincent Paris! <laughs> my djembe, you know, because I don't want to work. I just want to bang on my grandma all day, yeah? <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right. Hello, Florida! So, I'm having a great time so far. I stopped and visited my parents first. Uh, <clears throat> they live in the villages. They're retired. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, yeah, no, they, they drank the Kool-Aid. Oh, they love it. They drink it every day. They're like, it's the best Kool-Aid I've ever had. That place scares me. Well, yeah. We would have, uh, no, that's a myth. That's a oh, myth. No, it's not. Nah, it's a myth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's about my Hey, what you hear? <laughs> so, I would have gotten here uh, a lot sooner, but they drove me. And I broke. I said, we can use my GPS. And I was like, no, no, we have OnStar. <laughs> and so I dial the OnStar, and I'm, I'm sure on the other end, the OnStar people are like, it's ringing. <laughs> so they answer, hello, OnStar? Yeah, hi, we'd like to go to uh, Jacksonville, please. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> would you like to take the scenic route or the highways? Uh, whatever, whatever's gonna get us there. Oh, okay, then you hear the map unfolding. And... <laughs> so yeah, that cost us an extra hour. <clears throat> it was fun though, you know, getting up there. So, you never know. Uh, what I don't understand though, I figure, I, I would think the older you get, the less pissed off you get. Like, it doesn't seem to work that way. <laughs> I think the older he gets, he's like, oh, fuck it all. Who cares? Who cares? But like, look at this guy! Come on! Look at him! He just cut me off, and now, we're, now look how... Uh, I think it's all aggravating. But, you know. I guess that's how it goes. We just keep getting more and more pissed off the older we get. Some of us. Maybe not. I don't know, I'm babbling. We have any questions? Okay, good night. Tell us what you're up to now. She asked, what am I up to now? Uh, what's, oh yeah, we just, uh, I just finished the run on the Young and the Restless. That was a lot of fun. A few people saw it. Uh, yeah, soaps to me are fascinating because it's, it's, the, it's the only art form of its type where there's a, every single day another episode and, and it, the pace unless you unless you're, you've seen the pace done you just can't understand how fast it goes like with Supernatural you know you get the script you got plenty of time to read it you get into the subtext and figure out what you're saying and, and then you get on set and there's plenty of time to rehearse and you're blocking and then they set up the shots and go off, and if you have the uh, scene partner, you rehearse with your scene partner, and then you get on there, and you, there's an angle, there's a master angle this way, and then they come in for another medium, and then they go over the shoulder to get your partner's close up, and then they get your close up, and then maybe a medium, and a medium. the whole time you're doing the same scene. So by the time you're doing your close up, I mean, you got this stuff down, it is, it's like you're trying all kinds of stuff. With soaps, Get the words out of your mouth. Get them moving on. 
in one day. One take. And I'm not, when I say one take, I mean per scene. It's not one take and then you go in for the close-up and then the meeting. It's one take for the scene, next one. That's how fast they move. It's crazy. It's nuts. But it's a lot of fun. It's like, I feel like it's like the, it's almost like the punk rock of acting. Because a lot of, uh, all the punk rockers that I know, they're most, a lot of them are, are, are really well-trained musicians and they, they, they know their shit. They just, they're able to really speed it up and make it sound great that much faster. And uh, that's kind of like what I think like some punk rocking is. Um, some of these actors that I've worked with are some, among the best I've ever seen. They can get to places like this that I feel like there's, there's, there's say someone like Fanola Hughes, if anyone knows who that is from General Hospital. She's incredible. Yes. So I've seen her do scenes that you take that same scene, you put it in a film, you put it in a theater, it's an Academy Award winning performance. And she does it daily in one take. And I just think it's like you get to you get to work those muscles consistently. Whereas before I got on, my first one was uh, General Hospital, first soap that I did. And I had been acting for 20 years. And I felt I had to hang up. And you know, I had some, I had I had technique and I felt pretty good about what I could do, and people were going, oh no, what do you get? This is gonna be like a boot camp. I'm like, boot camp, isn't that the beginning of something? I was so wrong. I, I got I got on and I and I do I feel I felt like the improvements were exponential because you had so many opportunities to try things. You could see how how big you could go, you could see how small you could take it. And because it's sort of like theater in a way that <clears throat> or opening night theater every every day. And they're doing one a day, it comes and it goes. So the stakes aren't so high. Whereas with something like Supernatural, the stakes are a little higher because there is a intense fandom that will scrutinize every single way you <laughs> say something, how you do it, how you say it, for better or worse. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that's, that's one of the things I love about this fandom is you you all know this show so well, it's almost frightening. <laughs> but there's a lot to know about this show. So that's what's so cool about it too, is there's, uh, there's a lot of little hidden gems. And you, uh, you guys had taught me some stuff about, I think when I had questions, I just went on Twitter and was like, hey, so, um, What's the significance around Gabriel? <laughs> and I was like, oh my god! <laughs> okay! Got it, sorry. Sorry for stealing his juice. Had to be done. Yeah, well. I wasn't, I'm not mean, I'm just written that way. <laughs> uh, we have some questions? Hi. Uh, two things. One, you are incredible on stage, and karaoke, you're just on performance. You're just, your energy is infectious. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to have fun, you know. If we're not going to have fun, what are we doing here, right? What are we doing if we're not having fun? I got tired of watching you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my question is, if you could play any other character on the show, as amazing as Asmodeus is, who would you be and why? I'd say Dean because he's a series regular. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he's a really cool. I mean, they're both both cool characters, but I I, I resonate a little more with Dean, I think. Um, yeah, and he's been able to do it for 15 years. It's a dream. That is a dream to be able to, to be able to create an iconic character in an iconic show. <clears throat> that is, a, is basically the show is a living legend, as you can all attest to, as you be, because you're here because the show itself is a living legend, and it's, it's a 
TV history in the making. And another reason why it was such a, 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 a thrill and an honor for, to be a part of it, to be able to be part of television history, because these are all dreams that, you know, come out to LA, I came out to LA a long time ago and I had huge, big dreams, and they were all, they weren't, they weren't based on any sort of reality. And then, and then reality starts setting in, and then you just, you, I just kept running down the dream, and, and but it started changing shape and changing form, and, and um, it's, it, it sort of has come back around, like this whole thing with this, these conventions is it part of a dream that I couldn't have thought up, and I think that's one of the wonderful things when you can, when when I was able to let go of a lot of what I thought it should look like, that's when a lot of things really started happening. Um, and just allow it to be what it is. And, you know, that's still a daily practice, too. It's just allowing this life to be what it is, not what you think it should be, personally. It seems to work a lot better, and, and, and then I'll... You, you, and, then I, and, then I, and then I'm open to surprises. And things like this. This is this is, a, this is such an incredible surprise for this lifetime. I couldn't have I could have dreamed it up myself. Oh, what was your question? <laughs> Sorry. No, you answered it wonderfully. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, if you could go be on a game show, which one would you want to be on? Okay. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna relate to this, this uh, oh, a strange story that just happened uh, recently. Speaking of the whole dreams becoming a reality kind of thing, when I was a kid, I had uh, and I'm just thinking of a lot of this stuff as as, as a kid visiting, having visited my parents. I went up into the attic and saw a bunch of things and boxes and stuff, and, and so I was reminded a lot of, of childhood and. Uh, I had a black and white TV in my room, and during the summers I'd wake up and I would watch The Price is Right. And I loved that show. And just the strangest thing happened, you know, this, this past job, this, the, the Young and the Restless kid. I'm, I'm walking to stage, and I'm like, there's the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> and I look over here, oh, that's the mountain game. Thing. I was on the same stage as the Price is Right. It was, yeah, another whole full circle thing. It was just like, wow, I'm in it, I'm in it. I'm walking through it, it's crazy. So yeah, Price is Right, I guess. <laughs> I didn't, I would've gotten kicked out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or worse. If it would only be me getting kicked out, I would've spun it, but I think there's like, Guillotine involved. <laughs> Spin it before you walk out. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so, what would be your favorite line from the show, whether it's one of your lines or someone else's line? There's a new chef at time. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. That whole, I mean, they wrote the shit out of Asma Days. I loved his dialogue. Uh, every time I get a script, it's like, oh, yeah, except the last one, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but his whole monologues about the, I mean, it just felt so theatrical and, and epic and ancient. And, yeah, uh, I just love playing that. The accent. The accent. The accent. accent. <laughs> All right, then, I guess you made me do it. That accent right there. <laughs> accent! <laughs> hi. Hi. Wait, that way. Oh, oh hi. How are you? Panel yesterday about being an artist and your paintings. How did you go from being an artist to going an actor and going into television? 
First of all, where are you from? Did you, did you travel all the way here for this? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen. We got family all over the world, don't we? That's awesome. That's really awesome. Um, well, it kind of went like this. As a child, I drew all the time. And so the art did come first. And then, uh, you know, I started doing, I, I got a bike and I got out of the house and I was doing all this stuff. And the art sort of went by the wayside a little bit. And then I discovered acting. And late high school, I started dabbling again in, <clears throat> in paints, but just dabbling. Then I went away for a couple of years to, uh, to college to study acting. I finished in two and a half years. I didn't graduate, but I was finished. <laughs> and in that time, I was still dabbling. Then I moved to LA and started pursuing acting. And it was one of these things where <clears throat> when everything else was done, I would, I would attempt to paint. And I'd paint once every four months, maybe. Here comes the coffee angel. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then something really special happened. When I was 25, I believe, I got cast in a film that shot in Berlin. And I had never been to Europe. So I asked the production company to pay me in cash and fly me out of Prague two months later. And so I took the cash and backpacked Europe by myself. And it changed my life. One of the things it did, so it's, it was obviously, it was the farthest I'd ever been away from home and the longest I had ever been away from home. And this is before, was it before internet? Yeah, it was before internet, at least before I had any, any internet. Um, I didn't really have a cell phone. <clears throat> I didn't have a cell phone. Uh, and so there were some days that I'd go for a few days sometimes in, in some of the countries where I didn't speak the language and not really connecting with anyone. But what was happening is I would go into all these great museums and I would connect with some of these masterworks, some of these paintings from artists that have been dead 500 years maybe, maybe longer. And many times it was the, the, the subject, like the, the whatever, whoever, whosever portrait it was, I just think about who this person is when they lived, they lived an entire life and now they're gone and the artist is gone, yet there's this thing that they both left because they sat for that painting and the artist painted it that is still participating in the human experience. Here's this kid from Indiana having a real emotional connection to a thing that someone left 500 years ago and I, I thought, I want to get in this game too. And it felt like a, it felt like a, a a, a game that had, had proven itself. Because film and television is still, as far as an art form goes, is in its infantile stages. If we compare it to painting and, and music and dance, I mean, we do a lot of that in film and television, but you know, the, what, we're, what we're making is still, is still infantile. So. <clears throat> So I came back from that, I, I, I took my vows in Europe, in these museums, and I, I hadn't stopped painting since I, since I came back. And I just feel like acting and painting is such a, it's a, it's a great marriage of arts because you know, there is a lot of time in between projects sometimes. Sometimes a lot more time in between projects than I would like. <laughs> but then I have something to do and, and, and cultivate. I, I try and use my time um, wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. If, um, if Chuck died and you got to be the new god, how would you fix things on the show? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that whole question. I just, I got lost in the... What was the question? If I got to be god, what? 
tricks or change things on the show. Oh, well, clearly we start with the name, it would be the Asmodeus show. Uh, yeah. There'd be a lot more whiskey involved, I think. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think it'd be, I think the show, I think it'd be a lot more decadent. Everything would just be, it'd be a lot of decadence. And, uh, yeah. Oh, man, that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, does that answer that? Uh, yes. I mean, if I, yeah, maybe I'll try and write it and then I'll get back to you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um. I was admiring some of your artwork that they had on display, and I was wondering what your process is for creating art, and um, uh, kind of what other mediums, if any, do you work in? Thank you. Well, um, there's a few different. I have a few different processes. There's there's one. Uh, there's a series that is not out. There, but those are a lot of my animal uh, paintings. I, just, I love painting animals. I just um, they're just incredible. I mean, it's the designs of them, the spirit of them, everything. And there's a lot of times when, say, there's an animal that it, a lot of times it's an animal that I've had a connection with, or I want to have a connection with. And but there's this other series that is um, it's not out there. It's called Naked and Famous, and you can. You can see it on my website if you'd like. But it, it's, uh, it's life-sized portraits of some of the most incredible people that I've met in this life. And it started about uh, 17 years ago. I've been doing this series. And <clears throat> it's, it origi it, the, the original inspiration was the first time I went to Burning Man back in 2001. This is when Burning Man was still counterculture, and there weren't articles about it in my parents' retirement community's newspaper. Uh, and nobody knew what it was, and like you, you, know, you, you would you would go off the grid for a week, you'd shut down everything, and people would walk around, men and you know men and women, with their shirt off. A lot of people were naked because it's in the desert and it was really hot. But they always had like accoutrements on and everything. It was just a very free environment. And so this series was is I bring these, the people that I know and they stand with their shirt off and whatever accoutrements they would like. And we do it live. We, we, I paint them live and they're life sized portraits. And what I'll do, the process is, uh, it used to be when I first started it, it was when I was still really finding my voice as a painter. And I was all about speed. I wanted, I wanted to make it as fast as possible. And I knew that, I, that these people were volunteering their time, so I needed to also get it done and try and get it done in one city. So a lot of times it would be from uh, start to finish in one city. And the longest was like four hours, and the shortest I did one in an hour and a half. And then, as I continued, I started uh, I started slowing it down a little bit because I didn't need to have to go that fast. And so now what I do is I, I paint the uh, background first in acrylic before the sitter gets there, and I think about who it is, and what they mean to me, and how they've affected my life, what colors I can see around them, or shapes, and, and, and I'll paint the background. And so that's kind of its own painting. And then they come, and we stand, and it's very, uh, it's, it's a artistically intimate experience. And we paint, and a lot of times if they have, say, tattoos or, or like hats and jewelry and stuff, I'll wait to paint that after they leave. So now it's a multi-step process. But the result is the same. You come, you expose your heart, you stand, and it's on a 24 by 48 canvas. And it becomes part of this community of paintings I've now built up. And there are over 
150 in this series. So I think, I mean, who knows what's going to happen when we all leave here, but I think that's my life's work as a painter is this series. Because when I, when I get to display a lot of them together, it's there's something really special about it because I could, however big the wall is, that's how big the display can be. So there have been times where I found spaces that were as tall as this, and I can, I can stack them four high and say 15 wide or long. And I put them all together, and it just looks like one giant painting of a community of beautiful freaks. And then so that the, the, uh, the animals are a little different. Um, I think, I, it, for those of you who have seen some of the stuff out there, I, I've been painting a lot on wood. And that's fun, So because I take uh, charcoal pencils and draw it first. And then I get acrylic paint and, and paint it in. And I'll have uh, sandpaper and use that to sort of smooth it out sometimes. And it, I try not to get locked into any one technique because I'm self-taught and I don't want to claim to know I know exactly what I'm doing because I don't. Every time I approach a painting, it's like, all right, well, how's this going to work? Sometimes I get really frustrated because it wasn't coming out the way I want. So like, I grab some dirt or something and smear it across the painting and the rocks and scratches would be in it. And then it's like, oh, that's what it needed. So I don't try and limit it to any one thing. I just try and stay open to any sort of technique that tries to present itself to me. Thank you. Um, my question is, what has been your favorite part of Supernatural, like being on the show? I'd say the favorite part <clears throat> wasn't being on the show, it was after the show, it's this. Yeah. Really is. I mean, yeah. it is. This is, a, this is a very unique experience for, for an actor, uh, especially an actor that's... It, you know, by all intents and purposes. Like, I've done a fair amount of work, but I'm by no means super famous. So it's a strange experience to, like, having this, doing a QA and a about myself, having just been sort of a journeyman actor that's going from project to project and not, you know, I'm not turning, you know, having stacks of scripts going, oh, I'm going to get to those after my martini. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's this, and it's also to see you guys and like what, you, what, this, what this means to you. And to be a part of that is really special for me because I mentioned I go to these music and art festivals. And that's originally where I found my community. Where the first time I went to Burning Man, I was like, holy shit, I'm home. These are all the freaks I've been looking for. These people are just like me. <laughs> And I see that with you guys. I see that you guys have found your tribe and you found your community. It's a beautiful thing. And it's this, it's this shared interest. And then it goes beyond just the show. So I think that's what's, what's special for me about it. That, that I'm fascinated that you guys are interested in, in us as actors beyond just the show. Like, the fact that we're able to share the rest of our talents that we've, you know, because like I said, as actors, you develop other talents because there's time. And you never know if you're going to get to share them or not. And when you do, it's really something special. That said, it's one of my all-time favorite characters that I've ever played and probably will be. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. What challenges or frightens you most as an actor, and how do you prepare to meet that challenge? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What, what challenges or frightens you most as an actor, and how do you prepare to meet that challenge? <clears throat> what frightens me most about being an actor is never working again. Serious. Like, at this very moment right now, I don't know what my next job is. But here's how I meet that challenge today. These days, 
I know there is going to be another job. Whereas in my 20s, even in my 30s, I wasn't so sure. I mean, I can't be absolutely 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be another job. It's, I, it's the life of freelance artists in general. Um, one job ends and then it's like, okay, now we're not quite back to zero, but you just, yeah, you don't know, you don't know what's next. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess the, yeah, fear of, fear of failure is a huge thing as an artist and an actor. Um, and I think to, to meet that challenge is just getting up and doing it regardless if you're scared or not. Sometimes using that fear. I mean, there's a lot of times in auditions, I used to, I used to, I, auditions used to frighten me and to the point where I thought I might be in the wrong business. But then I realized what it was. It was I was putting so much uh, meaning and um, imaginary purpose on each audition that I would go and I mean my my lips would get numb. They'd be I'd be so scared. And now it's now that it's I, I've incorporated it into it's no it's just part of my life and it's also part of performing and it's a chance to perform. So now, especially if I like the material that I'm auditioning for, it, I enjoy I enjoy auditions because they're now it feels like a performance for sometimes an audience of two or three. But still, I get to do it. I get to do what I love. I get to act that day. <laughs> Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. I've heard that you personally have created some short films. Could you tell them, tell us about them, and is there a way that the general public can get to view them online? Or? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, that's another thing I do to uh, try and stay creatively expressed is, is I create, I, I make my own short films. I'll tell you about a few of them. Uh, and I apologize if people heard this yesterday, but I'll, uh, the, the, there was one that I did about 10 years ago, I think, and it was about two characters who were sitting in front of a fireplace on these two thrones, and it was all about self-fulfilling prophecies, and it was, it was, it's called Vincent and Lucian, and it... Oh, wait. <laughs> and it's it's this one enigmatic character, this this uh, fully realized creative being talking to this budding artist, and this budding artist is so desperately wants to know how to become his highest creative self, and so this whole this whole uh, short film is about how he can become his highest creative self. So what you realize is, spoiler alert, <laughs> at the end, it, you realize he was talking to himself. He had visited in him, himself in a dream and let him know how to get to be his highest creative self. Now, his work is weird. First day I walked onto the set of Supernatural, I got to walk around the set that I would be doing my first scene on, and nobody else was there. And I was just going, oh, wow, this is incredible. This is a beautiful set. What a cool show. I feel like I'm, I'm really getting somewhere. But it was the same throne that I used in the short films. Crowley's throne. But now there was only one. So I felt like it had all come full circle, that I had somehow that I made that film for my future self to get to that point, to, to, to play that character. So that was, that was one of them. Um, 
And after that film, that was a narrative film where I wrote it and directed it and, and, and we, we shot it. Up. And, and since then I've been doing these, uh, a lot of times they're, they're like travel films. I did one about Bali and that was more like a cinema verite, sort of like you're, you're just witnessing, you're just sort of floating through Bali. And, uh, and I set it to some music and it was, it, it, and then I did that for a couple of different places that I visited. And then uh, I did another one called Valentino. Yeah! This one's really special to me because of this subject. It, it's about this wild blue scrub jay, wild bluebird named Valentino, who came to visit me one fateful Valentine's Day in my house. My door was open. He landed right on the doorstep. I was like, come on in. Comes in, hops around, starts looking around. And I have, my phone was right next to me, so I pick it up and I, I start recording him. And I see him looking around and, and flew up on one of my drums. What the fuck is going on here? And then he flew out. He comes back the very next day. And so I put out some pine nuts all over my house for him. And he starts starts eating the pine nuts and stays a little longer, a little longer, day after day after day. And I started getting all this wonderful footage, and it got to the point where, well, you know what, I don't wanna, I don't wanna spoil, I would love for you guys to see this, I don't wanna tell you what happens, but it's a, it's a 10 minute short film, and I set it to some, some poetry that my, my little neighbor at the time, she was eight years old, she read it, and she has the voice of God, and, you see this relationship develop between me and this bird and, and, and what, it, what it meant to me and, and what lessons I was able to learn from having this bird visit me for, it went on like two years. And then right after that I went to uh, New Zealand and Australia for one of these cons. And each trip, well, they were like a month apart, but I, I extended it for 10 days and I traveled around. 10 days just because I'd never been over there. And during that time, I really got reconnected with the importance of nature. I mean, this was such a beautiful place. Every single hike that I went on was more beautiful than the last. And like, and especially in New Zealand, there were times, long periods of times, I felt like I was the only person there. It was like I would run into nobody on these on these trails and and there were waterfalls, and I would sit at these waterfalls, and like rainbows would form. And I'd, I'd sit, and I'd get up to leave, and I'm like, where the fuck am I going? <laughs> and what could be better than this? And I'd stay for like, and, and, and so I made, uh, I made a film about, about that whole experience too, and, and, and put some writing over top of that. <clears throat> and my neighbor, she, uh, she narrated it again. That one's called Gift. And it's a gift to you guys. It was a gift to me. It was a, nature is a gift. And it was, it was kind of my attempt to figure out what I could give back to nature. And I, and I in, the, in the film, you'll, you'll see what I came up with. But those are two that you can get, uh, you can get on Vimeo. Just type in Valentino and my name, or, and uh, Gift and my name, and I'd, yeah, I'd love for you guys to see that, see what you think. I think you'll appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Hi. I, I love you. I'm sorry I missed you last night. I was sick. That's okay. I don't know. I'm so glad. How you feeling? I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. Today. Um, my question is, um, would you prefer to play a bad character or a good character? Bad guys are so much more fun. <laughs> they really are. They're just so much more fun. And like, you know, you get there. A lot of times it's really therapeutic too. Because I get to do things and nobody gets hurt. It's a safe space. <laughs> yeah, 
I get to, you know, I get, I get to go, <laughs> and then bartender explodes. <laughs> or I get to send a, a, a Lucifer across. Is that time already? Yeah, yeah baby, it's them. <laughs> I was, uh, hey, there he is. Yeah. Let me yeah. Let me decide to show up. Speaking of good guys. Now we're talking, yeah, one of the good guys. Nice. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Well, hey, hey, thank you very much, everyone. That was awesome. Uh, I love you guys. Jeffrey, good man. Are you hanging out for Saturday night tonight? Oh, yeah, I'll be jamming with you guys tonight. You'll be jamming on the stage. Thank you for a great year. Thank you. Hell of a welcome player, Jeffrey Maurice, everybody. I really, I gotta give, that's a great, that's a great actor intro song for him. Yeah. And I gotta tip my cap to Norton, man. You have that like 80s drum thing going on back there. That you were in the pocket on that thing. Well done.